What's up guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be diving for one final time back into Sands of Aura. This is a game that we've covered twice in the past. Once when it released, uh, we checked up on it a while back, and now the game is in 1.0. So I've put about three or four hours into the game prior to the recording of this video to let you know my first impressions of it, and whether or not the game is going to be worth a purchase. I'll talk about those at the end of the video, but for right now, welcome on back in. This is an open world action RPG on a post-apocalyptic planet where everything has been converted into desert, and if you get too thirsty, you get, I think, I forget what they call it. There, there's like a disease, basically. Like, thirst is a disease in this game. Once you get to like a certain level of thirstiness, you become like a raving lunatic murderer. And so, inside of a desert world, that's obviously kind of, dude, that was some sick air right there. Uh, Inside a desert world, that's probably a thing that's likely to happen. So there's a lot of zombie psycho 28 days later guys running around with sharp pieces of rebar trying to hurt you. Uh, you are a knight from a secret order in this game. You crusade around trying to find resources and things to bring back to the city that you live inside of in order to keep people alive. And I think it's pretty compelling. This game has some really fantastic world building and some really incredible scenery. I do have some thoughts about the game, which we'll go over at the end of the video. But for now, if you wanted to get involved with Sands of Aura's 1.0, I got a link for you down below in the description. Then of course, on top of that, you can also take a look down below in the description if you wanted to find a link to my Discord and my Twitch stream, hang out live most days of the week. I'd love to have you as a guest. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So pulling on into the dock, you're about to see some gameplay here. I'll hop on off my grain wake. That's what that boat is called right there. Uh, the first big thing you're going to notice about this game, every single part of it is fully voice acted. And in fact, fully voice acted quite well. I haven't seen a lot of vocal performances in this game that are bad. And then, of course, you're also going to kind of notice that the game has a Tim Burton, almost Corpse Bride style graphical tile set. Almost like a claymation type thing going on that I think sets this game apart from a lot of the other titles that you might run into. Uh, this game does have Souls influences on it. This game does have Souls-like influences on it, but I would hesitate to actually call it a Souls-like. Uh, so there's kind of like an imprecision that exists inside of like the combat system of the game. That means that I don't think I would compare it quite that way. I would just call it an action RPG, almost in sort of like an old Zelda sense. So really the point of this game is that you get missions uh, back at the main area that you come from, the Salt Spire or whatever they call it, and then you go out into the game world. Usually they give you like two or three places at a time you can go to. You go and take care of those objectives at your own order as you see fit, and then you like return back to get your rewards and like the Salt Spire kind of changes or whatever. And it looks like we've got, I don't even know if it's called the Salt Spire. What's it called? Star Spire. That's what it was. We come from Star Spire. Now, right now, I'm using a glaive as a weapon because so few games allow me to have like a double-bladed Darth Maul staff. Uh, I'm kind of like over-upgraded right now. I've been doing a lot of kind of like the side objectives and things you can do. So my character's like a little tiny bit over leveled at the moment, but I've arrived at the Cinder Spire having become aware of like a conspiracy. Uh, effectively, there's some kind of weird thing going on with like gods and stuff like that. It's kind of hard to like explain in retrospect, but ultimately uh, I have a spirit that's living inside of me that I found deep down inside of one of the last aquifers that exists on the planet, the last aquifer had like a corruption inside of it. When I cleansed that corruption, a ghost came and lived inside of me. And now I'm just kind of following the ghost's prophecy and like doing what it tells me to do because it may be the only chance that the world gets to ever see flowing waters again. And so that's the rough narrative. The ghost wanted something from this location. I don't recall what. Like I got a mission from my order of knights that told me to go to this place in order to secure something for the overall water supply. But the ghost told me that while their plan is good, I should come to this place first and then go to the other place. So now I'm here. And it's up to you whether or not you want to trust the ghost or not. A couple main characters in the game were like, don't trust the ghost. I trusted the ghost because why not, dude? Am I about to get blasted, dude? I feel like I'm about to get blasted. Get out of here. You can stop that. Uh, you do have magic inside of this game. I haven't found all of the magics, which leads me to believe that maybe I missed something. It is entirely possible in this game to like miss out on certain pickups and things because there's a lot of exploration and there's a lot of hidden things 
uh, in the game. Like, this is a game that really, really rewards exploration. That may be one of the reasons that, like, despite the fact that the game's combat is a little tiny bit clunky, much improved, by the way, from the last time we played the game. I wanted to be clear about that because I feel like the last time I covered the game, I was I talked about how the combat was really like the one big albatross that was holding this game back. It had like really really clunky combat that needed to be streamlined and fixed. They actually did work on the combat. It's still the same combat that it was before, but they've made some subtle changes to the impacts and the sound effects and the camera work since the last time that I covered the game that allowed them to retain the same animations while still making the combat feel a lot more acceptable. So I am happy to admit that that problem has more or less been taken care of. Uh, but, but this is very much a game that actually has some incredible environmental design. This game has an utterly intoxicating game world. Like, the premise is just so well developed of, like, this world and, like, how everybody is desperate for water and, like, these things that they're trying to get their hands on. Is he gonna rush me? I couldn't decide if he's gonna rush me or not. And, and so, like... This is one of those games that really enjoys showing the player like sprawling vistas and things like that. Uh, this is a game that really respects verticality. And this is also a game that really wants you. You see this little ledge right here? I've been playing this game for about four hours. This little ledge right here has taught me that I should come over here and rotate my camera around and see if there's anything over here. Like there are loads and loads of secret things in this game, which mean that it's actually kind of like easy to not find a magic spell and just not have that magic spell for like the entire game because you missed whatever little nook it might be in. I've been trying to make a habit of after I beat the boss of a given zone, I've been trying to make a habit of going back through and kind of like exploring the area at my own pace. So like I wipe every single mob in the area. It does have respawning just like Dark Souls does. Instead of a bonfire, you have a bell in this game that you've got to ring. That was rude. Threw a knife at me, bro. You threw a knife at me. How rude. Uh, but you do have a bell that you ring in this game, and it respawns everything and acts as a checkpoint. So that part of it is very soulsy. But the combat lacks like a certain level of precision that I think is required in order to get you into souls-like territory. So I've just been calling it kind of like an exploration action RPG. Oh, this is dangerous. I don't want to fight on that ledge. That's like super dangerous. I don't know how I want to deal with this. I need to get past him, and we need to fight in here. Oh, 51 damage for that one, huh? Wow. He hit me harder than I expected. Uh, that is a recurring theme you're going to find from this game. This game, there's not really a lot of ways to increase your HP meter, except for, like, upgrading runes and things. Um, you get hit really, really hard in this game. You can upgrade your gear a little bit if you desire to do so, and in upgrading said gear, uh, you can get more HP or you can get more defense so you don't get hit quite as hard. That having been said though, in general, when you get hit in this game, it's gonna really, really, really sting. I gotta go run back and get my stuff real fast, and then we'll pick up from where we left off, right? All right, I got us mostly back to where we were. I don't recall what I was saying, but it probably had something to do with gushing about the fact that in my opinion, this game actually has really, really, really exemplary exploration. Uh, so really, there's like two components to exploration. You need to make an environment that's interesting enough that people want to explore it. That's a big one right there that people sometimes leave out. Uh, and this game has that just in absolute buckets. Like this game has a fantastic game world that you really want to get deeper into and you really want to learn more about. And so with regards to like exploration gameplay, I can't help but recommend the game. Oh, he fell off. I mean, I guess that solves the problem. I didn't really want to deal with him anyways. Let's grab our treasure chest. There we go. We got anything good? Oh, a new armor set. Nice. Uh, armor in this game is kind of interesting. So armor in this game is a part of your build. Uh, so every single armor in this game pretty much has the same armor value on it. They just have different appearances. And then on top of that, aside from having differentiated appearances, uh, they have different perks on them. And so effectively... Does that fall down? Like, what is this? This looks like it falls down right here. Oh, it does. Good. Oh, it's a loop back. Nice. This game has lots of loop backs and shortcuts, just in case you don't like taking the long way around. Uh, the game, sometimes, you can tell with the earlier locations they designed, there's a lot less checkpoints, and there's a lot less loop backs, and with the stuff that was developed, obviously, like later in the game's life cycle, there's a lot more of them. So with the first couple dungeons, you may notice that like the checkpoints are few and far between, and it feels like you're replaying massive chunks of a level whenever you die. 
And that is true. Uh, you are replaying massive chunks of a level whenever you die in the early game. But it seems like they wised up to that as early access went along. And so their later dungeons are much better checkpointed and have a lot more cutbacks and loopbacks and things like that. I don't want to open this. Hold on. Let me clear the area first before I open this. It doesn't look like a fight arena. Like, I'm not positive, but... I'd rather not deal with it. Uh, that was my special attack right there with the glaive, by the way. Bottom of the screen, you'll see a white meter and a purple meter. White meter is health. Purple meter is your corruption. Uh, so basically, your power as a knightly order is that you absorb corruption and you can rechannel it as magical abilities. That meter fills up whenever I hit an enemy. And then I can use a super attack that AoEs everything every now and again. On top of that, I also have magical abilities like that flame right there that I just conjured to burn that guy in front of me to death. You only get a certain number of magic charges per time that you interact with a bonfire. Oh, there's something over there. Hold on. We found a secret. Let's go ahead and get rid of these archers, though. They're going to be a headache if I don't. There we go. You do get iframes from your dodge. If you're wondering why I'm dealing so much damage, it's because I've got a really sick build right now that I deal bonus percentage damage based on the amount of coins I've picked up off the ground in the last, like, X amount of time. There's something over here. Yup. Oof. Risky business. Oof. Yup. Don't like that. I'm a little... I'm not, like, super afraid of heights. But I'm, like, a little tiny bit afraid of heights. You know what I mean? And there's another loop back. So there you go. We've activated this guy. So hopefully this will remain functional no matter how far into the level we get. While I was running... Oof. That's a risky... I don't know if I can make that jump right there. I don't think I can make that jump. It sort of looks like you can make that jump, though, right there, don't it? Well, I guess you could jump from a little higher and just take the damage. I guess. I mean, there's definitely loot over there. It doesn't look like there's a ladder or anything. This right here, this is what I'm talking about. This is the genius of this game. This is what it knocks out of the park perfectly well. They have, I was saying, there's two parts to exploration. You have to have a world people want to explore. Done. You need to give them a perspective to explore that world from. Like, done. This game is very vertical. It gives you, like, these wide scenescapes that you can use to look at the rest of the level. Every single level in the game is like this. A tremendous amount of verticality. Huge in scale. The levels are really, really good to look at. And then the second part is you've actually got to put the things in there that people want to explore for. Uh, and this game has that as well. I'm constantly checking underneath the ruffles of this game's skirt to find this, that, or the other. Oh, these must open later on once we get higher up the cinder spire or, like, the cinder tower or whatever the hell this thing is. All right. Um, I don't know. I guess I'll just go back around to what I was doing. Up the stairs and down the stairs and up the stairs and down the stairs. It's moving day. Let's see. Oh, there's a yellow over here. Oh. Give her back. Give... I don't know what this guy does. This guy could potentially be a problem. I mean, he hits reasonably decently hard, but he doesn't hit that hard. I just got to stay away from him long enough. All right. Oh, did I miss him with my magic spell? I think I did. All right. Oh, okay. I got, I got, that was my fault. I got really greedy right there. I saw how hard his health was getting chunked, and I thought I could just, like, forehead my way through it. Obviously, it's a really, really good thing that we activated this elevator. This is why I recommend you look around, because sometimes the shortcut that lets you get back to the boss, like, really quickly, after, like, taking an L, uh, sometimes that secret, like this right here, will, will make your life a lot easier. Imagine having to clear this entire level if you didn't notice that elevator right there and this little secret that went around the outside edge, dude. Like I said, they reward exploration in meaningful ways. Yeah, he's got smacked with a sword from behind. That kind of sucks. It sucks and I don't like it. I need to pick up as much coins as possible before we fight this boss because... I rely on it in order to deal my damage. I think picking up my own pile right here will do it too. There we go. You throw a bomb. All right. Oof, there's a big chunk, but he also chunked me back. Okay. Is he going to lie? Oh, he healed himself. Don't do... Oh, God. Okay, yeah, I'm going to use my bell then. I'm going to use... Oh, okay. 
Oof, you got big combos. Okay. I don't know exactly how many. Eh, we'll just finish him right there. Good stuff. Got an achievement for it, too. Oh, he dropped Sacramite. I'll talk about the upgrade systems in this game. I never finished my thoughts about the armor either. Sorry, with 30 minutes impression videos, it takes a long time to get the core, like, crux of all the things across. But armor in this game has unified stats. Every armor has the same armor that I've seen so far. It's five magic, five defense. Five magic defense, five normal defense. Then you upgrade it from there with runes that drop randomly off of enemies. Huh. And so those upgrades, basically every set of armor has kind of like a set bonus that it gives you that does a different thing. My current one is the Cavalier's armor. The Cavalier's armor, I get like a 10% damage bonus every time I pick up a coin and it lasts for a couple minutes and it stacks five times and allows you to deal ridiculous amounts of damage if you're already spun up. Uh, another armor might make it so that you generate 10% more corruption with every hit. Uh, another one might make it so that your magic is way more potent. You basically pick the armor you like the look of and the stats of, or like the perks of, and then from there, you just upgrade it for the entire game. He kind of seems like a guy that's going to hurt me. Like, I'm not trying to be negative here. I like to see the best in people. Okay, that's a lie. I'm kind of a negative Nancy. That having been said, though, he kind of has the look of a guy that's going to be a boss. Uh, so, who are you? The spear hand is half submerged in mud, surrounding her like a crimson ring in a sea of brown, her blood. The warrior's hand is clutched close to her belly, unseen below the mire. She looks up at you with eyes of dying ember. Like all the spearheads below, she is on the brink of the end, but as she shuts her eyes, you know it is not for good. The mud of the mire will hold her insides in place. No more of her unwelcomed blood dripping on my stone. Infection is her sole concern now. Beyond removing yourselves from Paragon's rest at once. Living one, claim this wounded one and go. Take also the body of the madman. None of you are worthy to die in this place. All right. I'll take him on back with me. What is this door over here? Is this going to be like a dungeon for later? I bet you it will be. Sometimes they have me like revisit locations that I've already been to. We knocked this one out pretty quick, though. I think this is probably... A oh, the gate's opened. Where does this go? This gate was closed before. Is this just like an even bigger loot back? It is. Okay, so that's like the official, official loot back. That gate's not open yet. I do need to go refill my bells, and there's a couple of spots we have not been on this map so far. I would like to explore further, so we're going to. I also need to grab uh, that ore vein over there. Uh, but throughout the game, you're going to be upgrading your gear, basically. Uh, one of the things about this, I'm, I'm guessing they did it for replayability purposes, but there's not like, at least not that I've seen, there have not been an absolute ton of upgrade resources. It has been my observation that uh, you basically have enough resources to like upgrade the hell out of like one or two weapons, which means that on a given playthrough, you probably get to try out one to two weapons that are kind of like maxed out. There may later on in the game be like farmable Sacramite that you can use to upgrade all the weapons and get them all going. But you build your own weapon in this game, which actually I think is really cool. It kind of reminds me of the sequence from Knights of the Old Republic or whatever, where your character gets the ability to make their own lightsaber. It's kind of like that in this game. You make your own weapon and there's a number to choose from. There's like a broadsword, there's like dual wielding swords, there's axes, dual wielding axes, maces, dual wielding maces. There's a double-bladed staff, there's a double-maced staff, there's a double-axed staff. Basically, you have different parts, and you slap them all together to make a weapon like 
in the first hour or so of the game. And I've been sticking with the Glaive ever since because I really, really like the Glaive. I think it looks cool. Uh, but it has been a concern of mine that were I to want to swap to a different weapon, perhaps the mechanism does not exist to allow that, maybe? Can I get up on that pillar right there? Nope, can't get up on that pillar. Uh, every enemy you kill has this game's version of, like, souls. So that's what that money is that I'm picking up off the ground. It's called Glimmer. Uh, basically, what Glimmer does is you can use it at vendors, stores. Uh, it's used for all the upgrading in the game. Oh, I thought he dropped an item. It looked kind of glowy right there for a second. He did drop an item. Oh, he dropped the potion. Yeah, it's another way that you advance. So this game has alcohol brewing. Uh, different alcohols give different bonuses to different play styles. And you find recipes all over the place. You also have magic spells. So here's the inventory right here with all my equipment. You have magic spells. I've only found fire so far. Uh, but it looks like there's lightning, frost, temporal, and martial. I only have fire at the moment, but you can upgrade your spells in a linear way to make them hit harder. Uh, you can mix and match too, so when you have multiple spell books, you can have your attack be fire, your block be lightning, you know, whatever you want it to be. You have talismans. This is another way you customize your character. Talismans are enormously powerful buffs that you just find around. It's basically a necklace. You take it back to a church, and they can imbue it on you. And then throughout the game, there's a collect-a-thon mechanic, kind of like Jinjo's. Or kind of like finding, you know, all the, you know, insert any kind of, I guess, Banjo-Kazooie type gameplay, Mario 64 stars. Uh, you find these things called scriptures. You turn them in at the church, and the more scriptures you turn in, the more active talismans you can have. And the scriptures are sometimes hidden in some pretty clever places. And so you're definitely going to want to keep an eye out for them. This was the direction that I didn't go in. I was nervous something was going to attack me when I came over here. 500 glint stone right there. Archer's shooting at me. Oh, he fell off. Nice. Thanks for doing that for me, pal. Uh, but there are a lot of things to collect. There are a lot of things to upgrade. And while the game does not have a stat-based level up system or XP or anything like that, it does have enough mechanics that all kind of like bleed into one another that can be upgraded in interesting ways that you can come up with like a build as you're playing the title. This guy's got to go. I'm just going to knock him down with my super special. Those big shieldy guys, man. These big guys with the shields are always kind of a risk. Like, you saw earlier, one stab basically kills me from those big guys. So even once you're comfortable with all their attack patterns and whatnot, all it takes is like a moment of laziness and you just get absolutely buried. Just like put to sleep. All right, let's go back around this way. It looks like that connects. Are there any stairs or anything back there? Nope. No stairs or nothing. Let's head on up this way and see if we can get ourselves into trouble. But yeah, by and large, I'm actually pretty happy with this game and where it's at right now. This game is never going to be a contender for like the best Souls like you've ever played in your life. But there's no expectation that every game is supposed to be one of the best ones of its genre for every release either. I think that's kind of like, how, dude? I think it's kind of unrealistic to expect. And so what I like about this game is that I think it captures a level of exploration that's actually quite entertaining. For me, as an explorer player who enjoys exploring areas and finding secrets, I like that a lot. I think the environmental design is utterly fantastic. Whoever the level designer is for this game, uh, he needs to be hired by, like, every major company ever because the level design in this game is just intoxicating. I've used that word before, but I have thoroughly enjoyed every second of exploring this world. Uh, the world is interesting. The lore is interesting. The voice acting is really, really good. I mean, there's a lot of things to like about this game. The thing that drags it down from being a contender for, like, why you should play this instead of you know, other Souls-like games, is largely going to be limited to the fact that the game has kind of like... The combat system is much improved from the last time we covered the game. However, uh, the combat system is still just not as tight and not as nice as other Souls-likes that exist out there. And so ultimately, that's going to be the thing that I think drags this game down to kind of like a really interesting title in a lot of ways but probably not a game that's going to hold up against like Lies of P or like Elden Ring or anything else like that, nor should it. This is an indie game made by a little tiny team, and so I think that expectation's a little bit unfair. 
but I think we're done here on this map. So let me take you back actually to Star Spire, and I'll show you the different things you can do over there for leveling up. The game does have fast travel, by the way, so you're not going to be stuck hoofing it whenever you want to go somewhere. Uh, there's not a whole lot to find out in the desert. I think that's one of the underutilized things in this game. I think they definitely could have afforded to have had like four to five hidden unannounced dungeons that have nothing to do with any storyline that you could just kind of stumble upon as a reward for using the grain wake mechanic a little bit more as it stands right now you're going to go to the locations that are marked at least that's been my experience you're going to do the quest there and you're going to come back uh, this is star spire this is the place where you're at home uh, your house is here uh, we've got a forge over here this is the place where you build your own weapon so basically you are going to pick like what type of damage you want to do. So like daggers, spears, dual wielding, glaives, one-handed slashing, two-handed slashing. You choose what head to put on your weapon, uh, whether it be greatsword, dagger, axe, whatever. And then the pommel, uh, pommel and codex. So basically these are enchantments that you put on the weapon uh, in order to make them better. You get different pom uh, pommels for different quest outcomes. Quests do have branching outcomes sometimes in this game. And you can't get all the pommels on every playthrough. Sometimes you're going to have to choose a side between factions. And they're going to give you their pommel. And you're not going to get the other faction's pommel. But there's a bunch of pommels in here that you can put on your weapon that customize it. There's also these things called codexes or codices. Uh, these codices are kind of the exact same thing as the pommel. They just make your weapon enchanted and more awesome. If you like the weapon you already have, you can upgrade it if you find rare resources around. Mine is like level 5 right now, and so it's pretty strong. Uh, you can also upgrade your armor. I haven't done any armor upgrading yet, but armor upgrading allows you to get more slots to put runes in on your armor so that you can increase your health or your armor and basically take the set that you like all the way into endgame with you without having to worry about it. And then finally, you can retrofit your stuff. Like, this has no codex on it. I can retrofit it if I wanted to. And then we've got consume power. When you kill an enemy, increase your damage by 7.5% stacking. Okay, I'll keep that on there. But for a 1,000 glitter stone here, I can reforge my weapon real fast to have that codex on it. So there we go. It's now got an extra enchantment on it so that I'm reducing the enemy's armor whenever I'm hitting them. Inside this area, there's going to be vendors. I talked about a rune system. That's how you customize your armor. Uh, you find runes randomly on enemies that drop off of them, and there's a runesmith over here. You can destroy them to get rune dust. You can combine them to make them stronger and upgrade their quality in a Diablo-like fashion from, like, white to green, green to blue, so on and so forth, to get the biggest amount of bonuses out. And so there is a solid amount of collectathon character building here that I'm pretty happy with. Uh, overall, Sands of Aura gets a thumbs up from me. I'm an explorer player. I think this game satisfies that as far as RPGs are concerned. The combat is much improved from the last time that we played the game. It's still sort of average compared. It's sort of, I guess it's still sort of above average to average compared to like what you would get out of like Elden Ring or whatever. But I, I think that the combat is no longer a giant, you know, busted thumb that you can feel your heartbeat in like it was the last time we played the game. Uh, it's now functional and working perfectly fine and I'm happy with it. And that in combination with a really cool game world, a really cool aesthetic, a whole lot of exploration, a whole lot of fun things to find. I have no problem approving of this game, especially if you can get it on discount. Is it going to blow any of the, you know, main contenders for... Is it going to blow any of the main contenders for Souls-like games out of the water? Absolutely not. But does it have a place on that playing field? Absolutely it does. Uh, I think this game is really, really cool, and I enjoyed my time with it. Uh, my name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so that you don't have to. The day up on the chopping block, we were fooling around with a little bit of Sands of Aura, the 1.0 version thereof, which may be one of the most improved games I've seen in a long time. I will see you all tomorrow with something hot fresh off the indie skillet, but up until then, it's time for me to go. Bye, folks.